Okay. Today's lab um, is similar or the same as far as technique goes, and it, it would have involved or would have involved uh, DNA gel electrophoresis. Uh, you would have been given five samples again. Um, those five samples you were get, would have been given would have consisted of DNA, but DNA not from one person. Okay, DNA from uh, four different people plus what we call uh, like last time a DNA uh, marker or standard, uh, because in this case. You're not trying to detect uh, if a gene or if a person has a cancerous gene. In today's test, it's paternity testing. Okay, and paternity testing uh, has to do with DNA fingerprinting. You most often hear about DNA fingerprinting in regards to forensic science. What it was is that as geneticists became more and more familiar, okay, with the DNA sequence, okay, in human DNA, specifically the bases. GATC and the combination that they can occur in. Okay, two things occurred. Initially, they realized the majority of the DNA that forms our 23 pairs of chromosomes does not contain genetic information. It's not in the form of genes. As I said in lecture, approximately only 1.5% or 1.5% of our DNA contains genetic information. Okay, so the remaining 98.5% they used to refer to as junk DNA. They figured it wasn't important. <laughs> but as I said in lecture again, they came to find out genes don't work unless on one side there's a promoter and on the other side there's a terminator. Okay. But then they also discovered that even outside of the genetic information that DNA forms, even outside of these DNA regulatory sequences called promoters and terminators, they came to find out that this so-called junk DNA contained certain combinations of bases that could be passed on from one generation to the other. Therefore, with advancements in DNA sequencing, okay, especially what we call automated sequencing, and becoming familiar, more familiar with what was supposedly junk DNA, only to uncover, no, 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 this junk DNA consists of, some of it consists of certain combinations of bases okay, that get passed on from one parent or one generation to another. Therefore, these certain combinations of bases in your DNA actually serve as a fingerprint, but a DNA fingerprint. But unlike our fingerprints, a DNA fingerprint, okay, doesn't exist in one form. There are many different combinations of bases on different chromosomes that have been found to be passed on from one generation to another. Okay, so unlike our fingerprints, okay, which I show you here, if you can see there's a double-stranded helix here indicating our DNA fingerprints are actually much more reliable. And then with further advancements in DNA technology, especially what we call PCR, polymerase chain reaction, which is, how do you say, an in vitro method of DNA replication. In other words, making a copies of DNA outside of a living organism. Okay, these combinations, discovering that we could fingerprint DNA by looking for a certain combination of bases and advancements in DNA technology, everything from automated DNA sequencing to PCR, eventually geneticists were able to show anyone involved in anything from paternity testing to forensic science. Don't rely on blood samples because that's really bad. You don't have to rely on fingerprints. If you can literally obtain one molecule of DNA, which you're not going to see, but if you can theoretically get one molecule of DNA, geneticists said, hey, look, we found that DNA, human DNA, and all living organism DNA consists of combinations of DNA bases that repeat themselves. Some of these repeats are very long. Some of them are short, four to six DNA nuke bases that we call short tandem repeats. And these different combinations of repeats found on different pairs of chromosomes in our human cells, okay, can be passed on from parent to offspring. Or, or if it's a crime scene, you can take a swab, one of those long stick cotton swabs, wipe an area in the crime scene that doesn't look like it has anything there. But if you can pick up one molecule of DNA from the person that's guilty of the crime through lab technology today, 
you could actually amplify or replicate that DNA to where you have so many copies of it. And if you know the characteristics of these repeats, how long or short they are and what chromosomes are located in one, okay, you can use DNA gel electrophoresis to analyze the DNA picked up. You can compare DNA from one person to say DNA picked up at a scene, or if it's paternity testing, you can compare DNA from mom to child to the potential fathers. Okay, so this is what we're talking about. So DNA fingerprinting focuses on what we call repetitive DNA sequences. So up here, DNA fingerprinting involves identifying unique DNA sequences in an individual with little chance of matching another individual's DNA. Now results are compared with family members, parents, to determine the pattern of inheritance usually focuses on what we call tandem repeats. How do we define tandem repeats? Repetitive DNA sequences. And I'll show you a couple down below. These tandem repeats, there are different forms located on the same or different chromosomes. This is what further ensures, okay, upon DNA analysis or DNA fingerprinting analysis, this is what further ensures, okay, that if this person is said to be the father of the child or this person is said to be the person that perpetrated the crime, that committed the crime, it's extremely hard, if not impossible, for a defense attorney to dispute it or for the person that's said to be the father to dispute it, even if they get professionals that are experts in this area. So DNA fingerprinting is much more reliable, but it's like I said, it's not just forensics, it's paternity testing too. More than one type of tandem repeat is identified to ensure there is little possible chance that another individual will match the same number and types of repeats. So when they're, DNA, when they're fingerprinting your DNA, Okay, it would be comparable to, I'm not just taking the fingerprint from your thumb or your pointer. I'm taking the fingerprint from every tip of your finger, every tip of your toes. <laughs> I'm scanning your eyes, everything. I mean, it's fingerprinting everything, but at the level of DNA. There are different types of tandem repeats. Some tandem repeats are very long, 16 to 70 base pairs in length of DNA. We call these variable number of tandem repeats, known as VNTRs. It's the only time I'm going to mention these. This lab would have focused on shorter tandems. Now keep in mind, if you're talking about a tandem, we're talking about one after the other, okay? So short tandem repeats. The short tandem repeat you would have focused on in today's lab, it would have consisted of DNA with a combination of bases, T, G, T, 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 A, okay? This combination of bases in DNA has been found to occur on chromosome pair 20, chromosome pair 16, chromosome pair 3, okay? And what happens is, what was found is in some individuals, you can find one of these combinations of bases on one of the two chromosomes or both that a person inherited from their mom and dad, or you could find this combination of bases repeating in tandem. In other words, Let's imagine each of these little triangles here, or rectangles, I'm sorry, <laughs> boy, that's bad. And let's imagine each of these rectangles here represent this sequence, okay? Well, you can see in tandem, we would have this sequence, TGTTTA, TGTTTA, and you can see in tandem, the sequence keeps repeating itself, okay? So it's not only repeating, but it's one right after the other. That's where the tandem comes from. These shorter combinations of bases that can occur in tandem repeats we call them short tandem repeats or simply STRs, and that's what we were focusing on in today's lab. Now, I actually condensed the lab. There was a, actually a paper fingerprinting thing to do, but we didn't do it because I just felt like if we're not doing this in person, it's near impossible, uh, even if you're a biology major, to, to get the message across. So I'm just focusing on the gel. Now, we already, this is review here. You had DNA gel electrophoresis is how you're going to analyze the DNA samples. Okay, you're given five DNA samples. One consists of a DNA marker or standard. The other one consists of DNA from mom. The other one consists of DNA from the child. And then the last two samples of DNA, okay, are from the potential fathers, father number one and two. And the purpose of the lab is to, it's paternity testing. So the purpose of the lab is to figure out, based on DNA fingerprinting, which of these two men are the father of that child. And we do it through DNA fingerprinting, but we use DNA gel electrophoresis 
okay, to help us get our, the results we need to verify which is the father. So we talked about DNA gel electrophoresis. You have an agarose gel. Agarose is a seaweed extract, okay, that when you put it in the solution and boil it and let it cool, it solidifies into a porous gel matrix. Okay, and when we let it solidify into a gel, we put wells or we put a little comb in here that creates wells so that we can put our DNA sample, add it to the gel. Our DNA sample will be in a loading buffer that has glycerol and a tracking dye. Okay, the glycerol helps make your DNA sample heavier than the buffer solution that the gel will be sitting in. Now, the reason why the gel needs to be in a buffer solution is because it has salts. Because why? Well, the technique is not called DNA gel. It's called DNA gel electrophoresis. You eventually will apply a current, an electrical current. From one end, you'll have a cathode that emits a negative charge. From the other end, you'll have an anode that emits a positive charge. If you recall, DNA has a what charge to it? A net negative charge because of the phosphate groups of each DNA nucleotide. Therefore, when you add your DNA sample, the glycerol makes sure that the DNA sample is heavier than the buffer solution and settles to the bottom of the well. The tracking dye helps you monitor the progress or the migration of DNA through the gel. So by loading DNA here, the negative charge pushes the DNA into the porous gel matrix. The positive charge being emitted on the other side is attracting the DNA or pulling it through and then the buffer has salts to help conduct that electrical current moving through the gel. Okay. Now, last week's lab, if you recall, okay, we were talking about a P53 gene mutation that was associated with contributing to a recessive genetic disorder known as Lee-Fermini syndrome, and that it just so happened if that recessive mutated P53 gene okay, was inherited by a person, we could use a protein called a restriction enzyme that would recognize the mutation and cut the DNA. Well, the, they also use restriction enzymes for DNA fingerprinting, for paternity testing, as well as forensic science. Except in this case, what they do is they use the restriction enzyme, okay, not to make one cut in the DNA, but what it's not showing here is the restriction enzyme will make two cuts in the DNA. The cuts will flank or be on opposite sides of where we would have, say, a short tandem repeat. That way, those that are analyzing the DNA, okay, don't have to work with too much DNA. They only work with a segment or fragment of DNA that contains the repeats. So they'll use restriction enzymes to isolate or cut out that stretch of DNA that has the repeats. These enzymes are called endonucleases. These are enzymes that were initially isolated from bacteria and used to cut or digest nucleic acids from within a DNA nucleotide sequence, thus the endo. Okay? The enzymes cut nucleic acids at specific DNA nucleotide sequences called restriction sites. So the enzyme is a protein, and it scans the DNA looking for what we call a restriction site. The restriction site is part of the DNA nucleotide sequence. So these restriction enzymes, there's many different types. I'm going to mention two down below. Okay, they're very specific as to if or they're going to cut DNA or not. And if they cut DNA, it's because they recognize a certain combination of bases in the DNA nucleotide sequence. Restriction enzymes are used to isolate. Restriction enzymes are used to isolate segments of DNA, such as our short tandem repeats for DNA analysis. Two popular enzymes used are BAMH1 and EXMA1. Listen carefully. The names they come up for these enzymes come from the genus and the species, as well as the type and the strain of bacterium. So it's very technical. So just know them by these names, okay? The one we would have used for the lab today, but it would have been done for you, is BAMH1. BAMH1 will scan double-stranded DNA, and on the forward strand, it'll look for this combination of bases. And if it sees these six bases in this combination, GGATCC, it will cut the DNA right there. This is another enzyme they mentioned, and it's just an example. It shows you, okay, how these enzymes, restriction enzymes, such as BAMH1 and XMA1, they'll cut DNA. That's what they have in common, and they'll cut the DNA sequence from within the sequence. However, where they cut is different. This other restriction enzyme, it's looking for this combination of bases, six, six, CCC. GGG, okay, looking for this combination on the forward strand, and that's where this enzyme will cut the DNA. Well, what we would have done is use BAMH1. 
we would have used MH1 to cut out short tandem repeats. So where the blue is on each of these examples, imagine that blue area is where we have this sequence here, GGATTC, on the forward strand of DNA. Therefore, what would happen is the DNA they pick up, say, at a crime scene or that was taken from one of the fathers would be exposed to that restriction enzyme. So it would cut on one side of the STR short tandem repeat and cut on the other side of the short tandem repeat. And therefore, the person performing the DNA analysis or fingerprinting would only be working with the stretch of DNA that has the repeat. Up here, DNA fingerprinting, PCR. PCR, everybody, the idea for PCR came up in the early 80s. By the 90s, okay, everything we needed, okay, had been either invented or discovered. It's a powerful tool. So it was PCR along with automated DNA sequencing that allowed for the human genome project, okay? But this technique, PCR, it also allowed for the evolution of forensic science and DNA fingerprinting. It is a powerful technique, okay? Polymerase chain reaction, simply put, it's DNA replication in a tube. PCR is a technique that makes exact copies of segments of DNA, greatly increasing the number of copies of that segment of DNA. The increased number of exact copies of a segment of DNA allows for very small quantities of DNA to be analyzed, such as in DNA fingerprinting. So as I said, if you ever watch these crime shows, they might, expect the real ones, you might see them walking around with this long stick with the little Q-tip swab on one end, and they'll be wiping areas where the crime occurred but you don't see anything there. You're like, what are you wiping? Well, what they're hoping to do is pick up just one molecule of double-stranded DNA. And then when they perform a technique called polymerase chain reaction and they put the samples, okay, the PCR, what we call PCR reactions, in this instrument known as a thermocycler, this instrument will replicate the DNA. So we'll go from one molecule, and they're not showing it here, to where each round, each time this thermocycler goes through a round of different temperatures, we'll go from one molecule of DNA picked up from the crime scene or from a uh, potential father to two to four, and it'll amplify it to where we have such a large quantity of DNA now. Now we can perform DNA fingerprinting analysis using gel electrophoresis here, okay? So this here on the right is showing you, hey, look, technically speaking, whether it's DNA fingerprinting for forensic science or DNA fingerprinting printing for paternity testing, they're not going to focus on one type of tandem repeat located on one homologous pair of chromosomes. The different colors represent the different types of tandem repeats located on the different homologous pairs of chromosomes is what they'll focus on. Okay, But if you come over here, this is the way it actually works. They're showing you. Imagine this is the STR that you're analyzing that I showed you before, made up of those six DNA bases. And they're showing you, okay, if they happen to analyze those tandem repeats in the grandparents, and then they analyze the tandem repeats in the mom and dad, and then they analyze the repeats in the children of mom and dad or the grandchildren of the grandparents, okay? And if they focus on the same homologous pair of chromosomes, so just say, let's just say this is chromosome pair four chromosome pair four, all these pairs, let's say they're just chromosome pair four, okay? What they'll do is they'll look for the STR, say, that we're, we're studying today, made up of those six bases, and they'll eventually be able to create a larger map, a better visual, indicating, hey, on grandpa here, on his homologous four, he has an STR that repeats tandemly, or that's a tandem repeat, or repeats tandemly seven times. And on the other homolog four, I have that same STR, but it repeats eight times. Then they'll come over, same homologous pair of chromosomes, same stretch in the chromosome of DNA, same tandem repeat STR, and they find it repeats nine times and 10 times on the homologous pair of chromosome fours in grandma. Then they look at the daughter. They look at her homologous chromosomes four. They look at the same identical STRs that they analyzed at the grandparents, and they find out, wow, we find on one of her chromosomes, she has the STR that repeats seven times. Well, if you look up here, grandmother doesn't have any homologous chromosome fours that have the repeat seven times, it's grandpa. So that tells the DNA analyst, well, then this chromosome must be the paternal. 
come over here and analyze our other homologous chromosome 4, and they realize, hey, this one has that STR, like this one, but it repeats nine times. They come up here to the grandparents, and they say only grandma has a homologous chromosome 4 with nine repeats, so this must be the maternal. Same process over here. By focusing on the same homologous pair of chromosomes, same type of repeat, they're able to figure out that the dad, this homologous chromosome 4 that has 12 repeats must be the paternal, and this one that has 14 must be the maternal. And then from there, if you look at the four children they had, okay, each of the children has a homologous pair of chromosome 4s that have one of these two repeats. If you look here, 7 or 9. And then each child inherits one of the two homologous chromosome 4s from dad, and you can figure out which is paternal by looking at the repeats, either 12 or 14. That's DNA fingerprinting. So not only is it for paternity testing and for forensic science, but you hear about these lineage, stu uh, lineage studies like 23andMe and what have not. This is what they're focusing on. Over here, it shows you how they would analyze crime scenes. Here's your DNA from a crime scene and they analyzed three different types of short tandem repeats or STRs located on three different homologous pair of chromosomes. They put it through PCR so that there's a large enough quantity of each homologous pair that we can visualize it in DNA gel electrophoresis. And they're showing you the greater the number of repeats, the larger the fragment of DNA. The fewer the number of DNA or STRs or DNA repeats, the smaller the fragment. So that also helps them determine. And then what they'll do is they'll take two individuals that are suspects. They'll take a DNA sample for them, but they'll specifically focus on the same pairs of chromosomes that they found at the crime scene. Okay. Again, through a process called PCR, okay, and knowing what type of re tandem repeats they want to focus on, okay, they will produce enough DNA from these two individuals that they obtain DNA, they will replicate that DNA, creating a large enough quantity of DNA that they can use gel electrophoresis to analyze it. As I said, the greater the number of repeats, the larger the fragment, the fewer the number of repeats, the smaller. You can see here, out of the two suspects, it's individual B, who has repeats at 11 and 9, just like from the crime scene, 8 and 6, just like from the crime scene, and five and two, just like from the crime scene. So you go across left to right, and I didn't emphasize that enough last week. You go across and see where the size of the fragments match up. Again, the greater the number of repeats, the larger the fragment. The fewer the number, the smaller. But everything should match everybody. If this person here, if just one of these six DNA fragments had been different from this person over here, this are those suspects DNA. I mean, I'm sorry, the crime scene DNA. That would have been all a defensive attorney needed to punch holes in the case or all that is needed for the potential father to say I'm not the father. So what I've done is I've given you videos. They're the same videos. Please watch these videos again. Okay. The videos include gel electrophoresis and how to load your gels. Had we been meeting in person, hopefully the results from today's experiment, paternity testing, hopefully your gel results would have looked like this. We number the lanes left to right. So the lanes, in other words, or the wells. So this is well number one, this is lane number one. This is well number two, this is lane number two. So in your lab, I'd put together a table that's similar to lab 10. Hopefully you'll follow it along. And well six, therefore lane six is empty. In well one, lane one is your DNA standard. And bottom line is it shows you that how, how gel electrophoresis separates DNA based on size. The larger the fragments of DNA, the slower they move. The smaller the fragments of DNA, the faster they move. Each of these bands doesn't represent one molecule of DNA. Each of these bands represent a very large quantity of fragments of DNA of the same length. Okay, so this is a large quantity. That's the purpose of the PCR. We take theoretically one or a few molecules of DNA we use PCR to replicate those molecules of DNA to where we have a large enough quantity of same size fragments of DNA to where it shows up easily in gel electrophoresis. Over here will be mom, here will be the child, here will be dad. So what you will do is look at the two potential fathers and see if any of their bands or fragments match up with the child. And then you want to see where any of mom's fragments match up with the child so you can figure out which father 
okay, or which potential um, a man is the father. It's no different. Oops. It's similar to what you're doing here. Similar to what you're doing here. Okay. I also posted a video. I think it uses guppy fish to go over DNA fingerprinting analysis. Please watch those. Okay, please spread the word around. I said this in lecture. Okay, I got at least two lab reports for Lab 10 where they didn't read at least the last slide on the PowerPoint. And we're, this is getting ridiculous. I know most of you know what you're doing and everything's going fine, so I'm sorry you're hearing this because, let me see, most of you, I believe, are the ones I'm not talking to for the most part. Some of you may be. Lab 11, give me a cover page, give me a label gel pick, answer the questions. Okay. Let's do a week from today at 9:30. It's the usual bit. Okay, we're on. We're down the home stretch. There's no lab practical. We definitely had <laughs> about half the class or more that should be happy. There's no lab practicals after the first one. Okay, so take advantage of these labs. Now, lab 10 and 11 are only worth 20 points because they are hard. I know they're hard. All right, so that was the reason for decreasing the point value. I was kind of shifting points around. From the lab practicals I canceled, I was shifting those points and spreading them out among the labs based on past results. You know, when is it more frequent or which lab do I tend to get higher grades with versus other labs? So this was the reason why. The DNA labs, yeah, they're not easy, and I wish we were in person, especially with y'all, because I know y'all were working hard. Grades weren't the greatest, but y'all were working hard. So, um, well, there you go. Amen. Are there any questions? All right, if there aren't any questions, I'm going to stop.